Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted uh, to talk again to Sheikh Hamza Karamali. You're most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Always a pleasure, Paul. Good to have you back, sir. Now, you may know uh, Hamza Karamali for uh, his famous Quranic Case for God free video series. I'll link it in the description below. But he's also recently produced a series that analyzes what's happening in Gaza from a theological perspective. His series is called The Truth About Palestine that nobody's talking about. And again, links in the description below. He's questioned in that series whether the Jews really are the chosen people of God. And he argued that the Dome of the Rock is the third temple that the Jews have been waiting for and that they missed the third temple by a thousand years. So you've said, Sheikh, that you that your analysis of what's happening in Gaza is different from how many other people are currently analyzing it in the news, for example. What exactly is different about it? Well, I think the thing that is uh, consuming all of our hearts and minds, um, and it should be consuming all of our hearts and minds, is the um, loss of life, innocent people who are being killed. And so how do we stop it? So um, we, we're doing political uh, advocacy, and we're doing this within the secular uh, world that we live in, appealing to um, notions of human rights, which we have a tradition of from within Islam as well, and um, you know, international law. Um, so in our activism to help our brothers and sisters in Palestine, um, using these secular concepts, I think that what's happened is that uh, we have uh, we haven't spent time analyzing what's happening from a theological perspective. Right. And that's really important for a number of reasons. One reason is that this is we as Muslims, this is what we're motivated by. And so we have a vision uh, of what is happening in the Holy Land. The Holy Land is holy to us. We have a vision of what happens to Judaism and Christianity. So it's important for us to kind of make sense of this ourselves uh, and uh, and under really understand what's going on. I think another reason why uh, this is important is because uh, in uh, when uh, when things are politicized, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a I'm not a political um active analyst it's not my speciality i'm a theologian so, yeah so so what but what i observe is that what happens is that whenever there's a uh, there's tensions there's conflict then uh the sense of opposition it often it uh creates a distance uh, between between people that is not really there and uh when you when we look at the theology of it then we can see that actually um, the, 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 the Jews and the Muslims, they're actually talking about the same things. And, um, and it's, not about, um, uh, it's not about what the you know, secular narrative uh, is portraying, it's about something else. So I think that's important to see um, so that we can engage in a, in a dialogue, we can have a conversation, um, and having that conversation is really, um, really important. So uh, that's that's what's different. Like, how do how do I, as a Muslim, based on my understanding of the Quran, based on my understanding of Judaism, how do I analyze what's really happening here? Uh, that's very useful. Yeah. 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 So uh, so so the way that I think the way that we need to start is that um, there is a before I, I you know before I look at what how I analyze it. I think it's important to understand how the Jewish people analyze it, because this isn't a, um, I don't believe that it's it's just like a secular thing. Um, there's, uh, you know, Israel is a Jewish homeland, Judaism is a national religion. There may be many people who are atheists, many people who are secular, but um, Jewish beliefs, they, uh, they are uh, shaping the events that are, that are happening. So just if I just give like a brief summary and then we'll unpack it as we continue the conversation conversation. Okay. Yeah. But the basic uh, idea is that uh, the Jewish people believe that they are the chosen people of God. And what that means is that they have a privileged relationship with God. And uh, that privileged relationship comes about by virtue of their descent from um, Israel, who's the prophet Jacob. And by virtue of that, God gave them the holiest place on earth, which is um, 
the place where the Dome of the Rock is standing, the Temple Mount, that area, it, they have a God-given right to that area. And they believe, it's part of Jewish faith, that there will be a great king, who they call the Messiah, who will come and he will rebuild uh, the Temple of Solomon. And that involves destroying the Dome of the Rock. And when he does that, then the Jewish people will become a great power, um, global power, and all the nations will come to, come to them and pay homage to them. So this is um, this is it shapes the way that um, that the Jewish people they they view what is happening in uh, in, in in Palestine. So uh, so so if if this is how they're looking at it, then how? how what kind of conversations can be had with them so mm -hmm. from the secular perspective um religion is all superstition god is a superstition and the solution is you get rid of religion you get rid of the bible you get rid of everything and you bring um you bring peace but i think muslims you look at it very differently because religion is important and god is important and the bible is important you know and uh and the quran is important so uh so how would we kind of engage them in this and how do we make sense of what's going on yeah um, yeah so um so i think that there are four points that we can look at um the first is um are the jewish people the chosen people of god that's the first question the second is did god give them the temple mount the third is will there be a third temple and the fourth is how do I make sense of this and everything that's happening now as a Muslim? Hmm. So, so we start with the first thing, are they the chosen people of God? Now, there's two ways to examine this question. Um, the Quran, it has, uh, the Quran, it speaks to the Jews and the Christians. And there's this phenomenon that modern academic scholars, they call intertextuality, which means that the Quran, it references um, things that the children of Israel believed in, and it doesn't mention the full details, but these things were understood by them in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And this is why um, all of our, in our classical tafsir tradition, when they were explaining the verses of the Quran, they filled in the gaps with uh, what our tafsir scholars, they called Israeliyat, uh, which means that it refers to biblical stories, stories in the Talmud, stories in the rabbinical tradition, um, th things in other extra biblical sources that were uh, that were circulating at that time, it references them. And at at the time of revelation, there was a particular, uh, there was something that the Jews and the Christians they understood. So uh, so when uh, so this idea of chosen people of God is something that was understood. There was there was an understanding about it. In the Quran it speaks about it. So the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says in Surah Al Maidah. He says that the Jews and the Christians, let's put the Christians aside, like how they come in and put them aside, but they say that uh, uh, which means that they say that we are the sons of God and his beloved mm -hmm. and beloved by him. And um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, he says, response, he said, Qul falima then why does he punish you for you for your sins? Um, but you are just rather you're just human beings, just like everybody else who he's created. So now, when when we see when we read this that you are, uh, then why does God punish you for your sins? The Jewish and the Jewish Christians, when they would read this, this is something that would resonate with them really strongly because in the in the hebrew bible there is a strong tradition of the jewish prophets coming to the children of israel and telling them that you are being punished for your sins and because of the sins that you will do god will destroy the temple and so there's many prophets that came um, and they warned them uh, isaiah jeremiah and these prophets they have names in our uh, we have arabic names for these prophets right isaiah is Ash'iya, jeremiah is armia there hasn't been a there's no authentic hadith that mentions them but the muslims they entered this conversation with the jews and the christians and 
these names through that conversation, they came into our Quranic narrative and they kind of filled in the gaps. And we had we had this we had this conversation. So, so these prophets, um, the the Jewish people, they they believed that they came to them and they told them that they should obey God and they should worship him alone and they shouldn't commit murder and they shouldn't commit adultery. And if they don't stop doing this and if they don't stop oppressing the poor and killing innocent people, then God is going to punish them and he's going to punish them by destroying their temple. Yeah. I'm going to, I want to talk about the temple in a, in a bit, but uh, in, in the, in, in Jewish history, in the old Testament, um, there were two destructions of the temple and the temple, mm -hmm. the Jewish people, um, they believed and they continue to believe is the holiest part of earth. God's presence is, is found over there. And, uh, and by virtue of their being the children of Israel, the descend descendants of the prophet Jacob, God gave that place to them um, to be the custodians. Now, in their own narrative, in their own narrative, they were punished for their disobedience. And the, this temple was destroyed because of their disobedience. And so when the Quran says, why does God punish you for your sins? This isn't like you know, Muslims coming and saying, Jews and Christians, you're a bunch of bad people, but it's, an, it's, 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 it's a dialectic uh, uh, argument. It's an appeal to something that they themselves believe in. They themselves believe in. Major theme in the Torah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, but, but very, very almost savage rebukes against um, the Israelites for their uh, rebellion and apostasy and going after other gods and likening them to adulterers. You know, the, the, uh, yeah. you know unfaithful to their to their husband, the husband, uh, you know, being God Himself. Uh, so yeah, very very common theme. You're right. Yeah, and and so and what they what they themselves relate is that when when these uh, prophets they came to them. They disbelieved in them and they even killed them. And so it's found there's, uh, you know, prophets were killed, there's biblical narrations there in the Talmud tradition uh, that they that they killed the prophets. And so when the Quran refers to the children of Israel killing the prophets who came to them, this is, again, it's simply relating what they themselves have have related. Yeah. So um, so I guess I think uh, the argument that uh, that I want to make is, is that um, if if uh, Jews are the chosen people of God and they have a privileged relationship with God and a right to the uh, the site of the Dome of the Rock by virtue of this privileged relationship, then God would not have punished them for their sins. He would not have destroyed the temple and he would not have sent them, driven them out of the land, sent them into exile twice um, out of Jerusalem and expelled them from it, um, if that had been the case. Yeah. So, uh, so what, this, what this shows is that the relationship that the Jewish people, they had with God was a moral relationship, which is that God made them responsible to behave morally. And if they behaved morally, they were chosen and if they weren't, if they did not behave morally, they were not chosen, but rather they were punished. So right. if and, and if we take this, it fits perfectly into the way that the Quran describes them, because the Quran describes the children of Israel, Bani Israel, the same word in Arabic, the same word in Hebrew. It describes them as being favored by God. It actually describes them as being chosen by God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, We chose them, knowing full well everything that they would do. And the way that the Quran explains this is that they were chosen by God because God filled them with good, upright, moral people. He filled them with prophets. He filled them with messengers. And he made the children of Israel for hundreds of years the vehicle by which he communicated his message to the entire world. So the uh, Jerusalem is located on a um, 
trade route. So people from all kinds of um, civilizations, they would pass through it. And when the children of Israel, when they're there and they have a temple and they're worshiping, um, it's through the interactions that they have with people of other races and ethnicities, they have an opportunity to convey to them the message of God so that they can also worship and submit to God. Right. So, so right. just to clarify, I, I mean, there's the, the other idea, but well, I'm, I'm a Jew, therefore I'm automatically uh, a member of the chosen people of God. That, that's what qualifies me. So my DNA really is what God has elected. My genetics, my ethnicity is this prized thing and gives me this incredible status, unique status amongst mankind as a member of the chosen people of God. You're saying that's not the case at all. It's not the case in the Bible. And it's certainly not the case in uh, the Quran a as well. But this yeah. is kind of eth ethnic DNA based to use, you know, a much more modern scientific way of uh, defining it. And DNA is used, is it not, in Israel to uh, you know, test the eligibility of someone to become uh, sort of resident in, in Israel, even though they may have never been there before in their life. Uh, they may be European or American. That seems th that's the key that gets you into uh, residency in Israel uh, on the Palestinian territory. This is completely untheological. It's not biblical. It's not Quranic. It's it's a very uh, it's a different secular uh, racial narrative with interesting parallels to other racial narratives uh, in European history in the 1930s, for example. But um, uh, is, is that, would that be a fair comment? Yeah, and I think that that's really important for Muslims to understand because I think Muslims have a good grasp of what was the key error, the central error of Christianity. The central error of Christianity is making Jesus God, even when he was, when he was man. But I think that most Muslims, they don't understand what is the central error of Judaism and what's the point on which they should be engaged. And I think that this is the central error of Judaism, mm -hmm. where, the, uh, where the covenant that God has made with you, a moral covenant, becomes something that is related to DNA, like, like you said. Um, so, and so we want to return it to the morality, we want to return to the morality. And that's really, and, and it's, it's, it's a very, um, it's a move that I think Muslims need to make because the, uh, because when, when we, when we return it to their morality, then we actually affirm their noble lineage. So Muslims, we affirm that the children of Israel were chosen by God. We affirm that there were great prophets and messengers amongst the children of Israel. And we ourselves, we venerate them. We follow them. And God tells the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells him in the Quran that those are the ones who God has guided after mentioning Moses and David and Solomon and the great prophets of the children of Israel. And so um, through their guidance alone, uh, you know, be guided. And yeah. so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to the children of Israel to call them, to call them back to the way of their illustrious ancestors. So yeah. While we while we we challenge this idea of them being the cho the chosen people of God based on their ethnicity, we affirm that they have a noble lineage, and that's why we're not we're not anti-Semitic. Nothing it's nothing could be further from the truth. And in fact, when we when we say in the Surah Al-Fatiha, "Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim," guide us to the straight path. This um, M many of the Mufassirun, most of them, they say that the Sirat al-Mustaqim, it is another verse in the Quran where, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, um, uh, Sirat al-Mustaqim, Sirat al an'amta alayhim, in the Fatiha, the path of those who you have favored. Who are those who you have favored? Um, in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that, Ula'ika al-ladheena an'am Allahu alayhim min al-nabiyyina wa-siddiqina wa-shuhada'i wa-salihin. That those are the ones who God has favored for, uh, from among the prophets and the righteous, and it mentions a couple of others. But when, when, when we say prophets, who are the prophets that come to our mind? The mm -hmm. prophets that come to our mind are Moses. They are David. They are Solomon. They are Jesus. They are all of these great figures. So um, 
so the and that's that's the message of the Quran that that I think it it needs to be um, it needs to be conveyed and. Uh, and can, can I, on that point, is a, a fascinating passage which I've, I've always enjoyed uh, mentioning to Christian missionaries, but it applies to this question as well. It's uh, a famous prediction of a new covenant we found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, um, uh, 31. I, I just read it's just, it's several verses, and it's fascinating how it impacts both on the Christian understanding of salvation and on the Jewish understanding of salvation in the light of uh, and, and the temple and the Torah in the light of what you've just said. It says in Jer uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, 31, a new covenant. Uh, the days are surely coming, says the Lord. The Lord there means Yahweh in, in uh, Hebrew. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Um, and that this Christians always reference this because th this shows that Christianity is true. Yeah, this is their argument. But it's fascinating when you actually read it. Just read it, like do exegesis rather than eisegesis, I see Jesus, it's a pun there. Um, when you actually read it, um, then it means something very, very different. So the days are coming, a new covenant with the house of Israel. So making a, the covenant is with uh, the Israelites, not with Gentiles. That's the first point. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them out by the hand to bring them out of the, the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says the Lord. So this is the covenant that Christians refer to. OK, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they say to each other or you know, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. Um, for I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sin no more. Now, what's so amazing about this passage? Um, so I will make the house of Israel. Um, I will I will put it on. I will put the Torah on their hearts. So the Torah is not abolished. The Torah is still operative. It's meant to be followed in this new covenant. Yeah, that's the first point. So Christians who cite this passage about the new covenant that Christians are living under, Christians don't follow the Torah anymore. They don't follow the 613 commandments of the law. Obviously, 99% of them eat pork, for example, and that's prohibited in the Torah. Um, so that, that's the first point. It can't be referring to the Christian idea of the new covenant that they think they're living in and is prophesied in this very passage that they always refer to. So firstly, it can't be used by Christians in that way. Secondly, and this is more perhaps to your point, is that um, the, the law will be written on their hearts so they will be able to obey the law of God and no longer shall they each to one another say, know the Lord. They will all know him from the least to the greatest, because they will have the law within them, within their being itself. So this is a profoundly moral, spiritual, theological covenant where obedience is taken to the next level. It's not just an exterior obedience, if, that, if I can use that word. It's now profoundly interior as well. Now, this is not an ethnic DNA-based covenant. Ah, you're a Jew because you are ethnically Jewish and therefore you're part of the people of God. No, the covenant is about the DNA, sorry, it's about the, the Torah within that you obey and you acknowledge your, your God. See, it's very spiritual, theological, Islamic in the sense you described it, you know, bringing back the remembrance of, of the true meaning of covenant. So it both challenges the a typical Christian narrative about this being the new covenant prophesied because under... Paul's dispensation, the Apostle Paul, the law has been abolished, as he says in Ephesians 2.15. We don't follow the commandments and ordinances. No, that's been abolished. Clearly, he is in violation, Paul is, of the teaching of Jeremiah here. So I think it's a fascinating passage, if it's authentic, that um, speaks to what you're saying powerfully, that authentic Israelites, Jews, the today's the, the uh, modern descendants of these people, if they're going to be Jewish in the authentic sense must follow the Torah. In other words, make God their Lord, acknowledge Allah as the one true God and not just hold up a, a, a piece of paper that's saying I'm a Jew. I have a right to live in Palestine because my DNA says I do, which yeah. seems to be often the Zionist way, unfortunately. So the the Quran, this is why so many times when it uh, quotes Jesus, uh, Jesus says that uh, I come to you to confirm min al I come to confirm the Torah that came before me. Uh, 
Yeah. Which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's a correction of, uh, of, uh, you know, modern day Christianity, which says that the law is abolished. Um, I think that also, um, when Christians, when they call, uh, when they refer to, um, the second half of, of, uh, of the Christian Bible as the new, new Testament, I think it's, it's really interesting because new Testament, new covenant, um, it means that there was a widespread idea amongst um, the Christians and the, uh, and the Jews uh, at the time of the coming of Jesus that there was going to be a new covenant. Yeah. There was going to be a new law. And, uh, and, and I think it's really clear that it's not, it's not Christianity because yeah. there is no, there, it's like their law is no law. Christianity is interesting. It's a, it is actually possible to say, the, but of course, initially the various Jesus movements, many of them were Torah observant Jews, like James, the head yeah. of the church, famously, the brother of Jesus. So it's only a particular Gentile version of what became yeah. the dominant form, I through people like Paul, that we have Christianity. But originally it wasn't like that. They were the Ebionites and the Jewish Christians, and they upheld the Torah, like Muslims do. They uphold the, the, the Sharia, which is very similar mm. to the Torah in many ways. Yeah. You know, what came to my mind as you were reading those verses, like the early Muslims, um, the companions, they used to, and the early Muslims after them, they used to speak of the Muslims. They used to say, Their Bibles are in their hearts. And uh, and the reason why they used to say that is because the Quran is memorized. So uh, so when the Quran is memorized and there's laws in the Quran that are memorized, you're literally, you're walking around with, um, with the law in your heart. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, but to kind of come back to yes. our our uh, what we're talking about is that uh, is that the chosenness. So the chosenness of Jewish people was based on their morality, and what that also entails is that the original um, Jewish religion was universal in its outlook. That's and that's something that uh, is not uh, it's not the case anymore. But in the Quran, when the Quran it talks about Solomon, uh, the prophet Solomon, not just the King Solomon, but the prophet Solomon, uh, he called people to submit to God. And the Queen of Sheba, famously um, in the Quran, it says, Aslamtu ma'a Sulaymana lillahi rabbil alameen. I have become Muslim. I've submitted to God with, with Solomon, uh, to God, the, the, Lord, the Lord of the worlds. There was a um, uh, there was a Jewish kingdom of Arabia, the Himyarite kingdom of Arabia, just before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where where some Arabians had converted to Judaism, um, because it was it was Islam, um, and uh, and Moses when he came and he uh, called the Pharaoh, uh, it wasn't just to let my people go. It was also he was calling him in the Quran to believe in him as a messenger from God. Uh, so. Uh, so there is so the, the religion was for everybody and in, in the dedication of the temple to uh, Solomon's building of the temple it was uh, you know he makes a prayer for people uh, who are not from the children of Israel who come to pray at the temple and he asks God to hear their prayer and to answer it and uh, so that so that his name can be hallowed and venerated um, at the temple right. so uh, yeah so i think um uh the so that's like one one idea um the other idea is this idea of um the temple and uh so um there's a translation of the seerah of ibn hisham by a um an orientalist one of the earlier orientalists his name is alfred gillom and uh, Alfred Gillon died in 1960, British scholar. Most of the early Orientalists were clergymen, well, well studied in the Bible. And Alfred Gillon, he was a scholar of Hebrew as well. He taught Hebrew. And when he translated this uh, Sira, he refers to the Kaaba as a temple. And I remember reading this decades ago, and I said, you know, I didn't understand why. Why is he calling it a temple? Like yeah. he's getting, but the reason why he was calling the Kaaba a temple is because when he came from his understanding of Hebrew and he's reading the Arabic and he understands the Old Testament, um, he it was his judgment that the Kaaba is a temple like the Sol like, like the Temple of Solomon 
was a mm. temple. And he doesn't explain this, but if you go to the Hebrew, um, then the, the Temple of Solomon, it's in Hebrew, it's called a bait. And yeah. that's the same word that Muslims use in Arabic when they refer to the Kaaba as bait. It's baitullah. Baitullah. Yeah. Now, bait in Arabic, in especially in modern Arabic, the common usage of the word bait is a house. It's a place that you live in. And so Muslims, they translate the Kaaba as the house of God. But then they need to kind of explain that really like, it doesn't mean God lives there. It just means that you face it. You face that, that direction in prayer. Um, but the, uh, the commentators, like Ibn Hajar, one of the greatest uh, commentator of Sahih Bukhari, he explains that, that the word bait, when we refer to the Kaaba as the bait of God, it <laughs> means a building that's dedicated to the worship of God. A building that's dedicated to the worship of God. And in the English language, that's exactly what the word temple means. The word mm -hmm. temple, a temple is a building that is dedicated to worship. And, it, it, and a Hindu temple or a polytheist Greek temple or Roman temple would be for an idol. But the temple of Solomon was not for an idol. It's a building that's dedicated to the worship of God. So mm -hmm. the uh, so what this uh, kind of, you know, Muslims say, why, why, why do you, you know, temple? Of, they, they think that when we talk about the temple of Solomon and the Jewish people, they talk about the temple of Solomon, it's this foreign thing, like a yeah. like a Hindu like a Hindu temple, but uh, but the structure that uh, that Solomon Suleiman alayhi salam he built on uh, the Temple Mount. Temple Mount it's a hill, uh, a hill in Jerusalem, on top of which there was a building that was built for the worship of God alone. Um, and so that it, so that 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 so that was on a hill, and in Mecca there was a building that was built for the worship of God alone, and it's in a valley, and uh, so uh, the valley of Mecca. And there's a hadith in Bukhari that says that there were forty years between the construction of these two uh, temples, buyut. Scholars they differ what that what that means. Some yeah. say that it was uh, actually built um, very early on from the time of Adam. Others say that Abraham built it, but it was a, and others have other opinions. It was, there were, there was, well, that place was venerated as just like Mecca was venerated from early, from the earliest of times. And, uh, and Solomon, he built that as a place for the worship of God. And when we, when you look at the kinds of things that used to happen there, um, you know, the, the, the Jewish people, they would face, that direction when they prayed um, in the same way that we face the Kaaba when we pray. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when in throughout the Meccan period, um, the, his Qibla, the direction that he faced was uh, the Temple of Solomon. It's where the Dome of the Rock is right now. That's the direction that he used to face in prayer and mm -hmm. continued to until after the Hijrah, until the abrogation. And so he kind of... I think the prophet, uh, peace upon him, worship, uh, worshipped in that direction of prayer uh, chronologically for longer than he worshipped uh, yeah. in the direction of Mecca. Actually, yeah. the in Mecca, interestingly enough, and I, I didn't realize you pointed this out in one of your videos. I didn't realize that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, and and so I think that the but what Muslims don't realize is that the reason why he was doing it was to confirm the sacredness of that site before him. So the, uh, the Aqsa, Al -Aqsa uh, the Dome of the Rock, Masjid Al-Aqsa, is a holy place before the Prophet went there on Isra and Mi'raj. And, uh, and the Prophet confirmed it because it was the Qibla, it was the direction of prayer of the Prophets of the Children of Israel. And by facing that direction, he was telling people that he is just like David. He's just like Solomon. He's just like Jesus. He's just like he's not something new in the line of prophets. So, uh, so what that means is that the the temple, that qibla, that uh, that direction of prayer, is a holy place for the children of Israel, and it's also a holy place for the Muslims. So, um, what? Uh, and why is it a holy place for the Muslims? It's a holy place for the Muslims because it's a site that the one true God, he taught his prophets and messengers to make it a place where people come to submit to God alone. 
and the uh, and the people who submit to God alone uh, today are the Muslims. And so the that place is a place for the submission of God. And so what is the temple? And so so if I you know, definitely it's important to keep to have definitions in our mind. If a yeah. temple uh, to the to to the Jewish people, um, the te a temple is a structure that is built by a particular ethnicity of people by virtue of their privileged relationship with God. But for us, a temple is a structure that is built for submission to the one true God. And, and so this is, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's a correction and that's what it should be. And if you go to the, um, and it's possible to make an argument from the, uh, from the Jewish scriptures to, to show that that's actually the intent, the fact that it was destroyed twice, it shows that. Um, so that is, uh, so that's what the, that's what the temple is. So the temple was, it was in a state of um, destruction. It was destroyed twice. Uh, there's the first destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, and then there's a second destruction after um, after Jesus. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. So just to say, just a footnote here that uh, that I've noticed that some Christians often accuse Muslims of worshiping the Kaaba. You know, oh, you bow down to the Kaaba, you're worshiping the building. Of course, that's, that's rubbish. Anyone who has any understanding of Islam will know that that's not true. It's merely a direction of prayer. But it's interesting they never accuse Jews of worshiping. The Temple Mount when they face Jerusalem, which they've always done yeah. in their prayers even today, or mm -hmm. they never accuse the early Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, who chronologically in his life actually more, spent more time worshiping the direction of Jerusalem rather than Mecca, as you have correctly said. They never accuse him of worshiping the Temple building in Jerusalem. They seem to have this odd fixation with the Kaaba, worshiping the Kaaba, but they never accuse the Jews of that, of this alleged idolatry, even though it's exactly the same orientation, literally the orient to the east, um, and the same kind of disposition of unity amongst the people of God, praying in one direction as commanded by uh, the prophet. So anyway, just wanted to footnote that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think they... Um, they uh, the christians they forgot what the temple is mm. so um so after the temple was destroyed the second time and the second destruction of the temple is interesting because uh, the second destruction of the temple um the um the jewish people they they have trouble um explaining why the second temple was destroyed because the first temple was destroyed because they disobeyed their prophets but mm. the second temple why was it destroyed so they'll say that they there's a problem christians or jews you say the jewish people the jews, oh, okay right so so they will say that well we were following the torah right um and so uh, because as far as because jesus because th when they they don't believe that john the baptist is a prophet they don't believe that jesus is a prophet they don't believe that zechariah the father of john the baptist was a prophet and uh john the baptist was killed by the son of herod the great um, and uh, Jesus was, they tried to kill him. And according to Muslim sources, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist was also, was also killed. So, um, so the way that they explain the destruction of the second temple, they say it's a, it's because the Jews were fighting with each other. There wasn't unity. This is a sign that we need to be united. Um, but if you put it in the, in the Muslim perspective, it's consistent there. Uh, it's uh, the reason for the destruction of the first temple is the same reason as the reason for the destruction of the second temple. And then after the destruction of the second temple, uh, it lay in ruin for 500 years because first the Romans, uh, they desecrated it. And then uh, when uh, the Byzantines, they became Christian, uh, the temple mount was not holy to the Christians. Yeah. So the holiest sites in Jerusalem for the Christians are not, is not the temple, but it's the church of resurrection and these other, um, um, these are these other sites associated with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So uh, according to according to their belief. So the so for 500 years, the the site of the temple, it was uh, it, it was uh, it was lying in desecration. And when the Muslims came, the Muslims came in the time of 
the second caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab, um, about, about a decade uh, after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu passed away. And when they, when they came, uh, Umar, he brought a Jewish convert with him who would become Muslim. And his name is Kaab al -Ahbad. And when he entered Jerusalem, Jerusalem was a peaceful surrender. It was, uh, you know, there was no bloodshed. Um, yeah. the, 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 the bishop, the patriarch of Jerusalem, Christian patriarch, he said, I, I, I'll surrender, but on condition that the caliph of the Muslims himself comes to take the keys from me, which is um, kind of like a humiliating uh, you know, request. Uh, you, know, you could just storm the walls and do what you want. But the, uh, the, 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 the caliph, Umar ibn Khattab, he came personally. Um, to take the keys, and it was a uh, he didn't pray in the church of the Christians because he said that uh, that my, the Muslims will take it um, as a place of worship afterwards, um, and uh, and and so. But the first thing he did when he came into Jerusalem is he said, "Where is where is the site of the first qibla?" Yeah. And it was and uh, and the Jewish uh, convert Kabul Ahbar he helped him locate it. Um, so and the place that he that he located is where the Dome of the Rock now stands, and it was a in our sources it says it was a garbage dump, and so he got down on his hands and knees. This is like the caliph, like he's a, he used to say, Sayyidina Umar, he used to say that there's nobody, uh, there's nobody more. Uh, uh, he used to say it as a, he was embarrassed. He said, Yeah, Allah forgive me, and he said, There's nobody more powerful. In the than than God <laughs> because the Muslims this was the height of Muslim power, mm -hmm. and he came and he got down on his hands and knees and he was cleaning that area and all of the Muslim armies they got down on their hands and knees and they were cleaning that area, so uh, uh, because it's a holy site, um, and then the time for the prayer came, and uh, and Kaab al Ahbar the Jewish convert he said let's um, so uh, if you uh, if, uh, Ka the Kaaba is in the in the south, and uh, Jerusalem is in the north. Hmm. So what uh, the 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 Jewish convert he said, let's pray from behind the the temple, uh, the the Dome of the Rock where it stands now, so that we when we face the Kaaba, we we place the old Qibla in between us, hmm. and that way we we face both. And uh, the the Caliph Omar he said uh, he had <laughs> he said that you still have some Jewishness in you, and he said uh, no we're not gonna we're not gonna do that because it was abrogated we're gonna venerate it we're gonna respect it but the facing this qibla is abrogated so he then he said we're gonna we're gonna we're going to pray on the other side so if this is if if you know this is Jerusalem this is Mecca he prayed below but closer to the side. Closer to the side of the of Kaaba, and so if you see videos of Muslims lined up in prayer, uh, Salatul Taraweeh and other prayers, you actually see the Dome of the Rock behind them. Wow. If you watch the videos, because uh, they uh, they and that's why the what is now known as uh, Jami Al Aqsa, uh, the the place of prayer of Al Aqsa, it's also called Al Masjid Al Qibali, the the mosque that's in the direction of the Qibla, with the Dome of the Rock behind you, where you go and pray. It's it's down there, um, and that's where the where the Caliph Umar he prayed. So um, so after he prayed, uh, the when he first prayed there, there's just a small wooden structure there, mm -hmm. and then in the uh, a couple of decades later, uh, Muslims they built um, they built monuments, and the the first monument that they built before they actually built this masjid where the, where the, where the where Sayyidina Umar he prayed before that they built the the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. Um, and so the Dome of the Rock is the oldest surviving Islamic monument in the world. The oldest surviving Islamic monument in the world, you just said. Very, very interesting. And, and it's, what's amazing is it's intact, as far as I can see. It's beautifully yes. preserved, and it's a work of art, architecturally, aesthetically. Yes. It's a beautiful object, and it's intact. And it's the very earliest extant um, Islamic structure in the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the dome, people, uh, people don't realize that the reason why people make domes, they used to make domes, is that the domes, they are there to signify that the thing underneath them is special. So the green dome in the, in the mosque of the Prophet, yeah. what does that signify? It signifies that underneath this spot, the Prophet Muhammad is buried. Right. So it's a way of honoring the thing that is underneath it. Yeah. So the dome of the rock, it's a dome that's built 
to honor the thing that's underneath it. And what's yeah. underneath it? A rock. That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. So that Dome of the Rock, if um, when I um, I went, I, I, don't know, I had the I had the blessing of visiting it um, as a um, seventeen year old. So I I went there and uh, and I prayed there. And what they what they would say is that this was the place where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was taken up to heaven from. So there's the, the Isra, the night journey, and then he was taken up to heaven from there. Now these things, these are not you can't. There's no Quranic verse about it. There's no hadith about it, right? Uh, but it's a it's a it's a good guess. It's a good guess based on what the Muslims understood that area to be, even when the Caliph Umar, when he came, he brought a Jewish convert, right? And so, mm -hmm. which, which meant that the, the Jews, they had preserved memories of where the holiest spot on the Temple Mount used to be. And what is that holiest spot? That holiest spot is where the, uh, the Temple of Solomon stood, which is analogous to the Kaaba. It's right. like, it's analogous. Uh, People would face it in prayer. They would make sacrifices there. They would make pilgrimage to it, um, and uh, and so so that was that was rebuilt. And so that that so now the, what's happening now is, um, and this is why the theology is important to understand, is that um, ever since the destruction of the first temple, uh, the Jewish scriptures they have prophecies from their prophets, and these prophecies. They predict that there will come a time when the temple will be rebuilt. Yeah, the temple will be rebuilt, and the and all nations will come to Israel. Mm. And so they've been waiting for this. And in their uh, in their uh, in, the, in their other sources from the rabbis, um, it's the third temple is associated with the coming of the Messiah, who they believe is a great king. Who is going to uh, rebuild the third temple? The temple is really important to uh, uh, Judaism because uh, there are many, many commands. Many of the six hundred thirteen commands they can only be fulfilled through the temple. So, uh, and and God's presence, it's associated with that site. So, uh, so according to this, according to these prophecies. Um, the way that the, the 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 Jews they understand this is that there will come a day when the dome of the rock will be destroyed, oh. and it will be replaced with a temple with a Jewish temple, and the person who will do this will be the Messiah, and the uh, and the and then and then and when he comes he will be like the great kings of the children of Israel David and Solomon he will be from their line. And he will restore the kingdom of God to Jerusalem, and which is an allusion to verses in the Bible. He'll restore the kingdom of God to Jerusalem, meaning he'll rule by their law, by their Sharia, and uh, and the Jew and the Jewish people will become a powerful nation, and it will remain like that until the end of time. So, uh, so that's that's their expectation, and this is this it's this belief that is really the cause of what's happening like at the uh, you know what's happening in palestine this is what it's this is what it's about so um and uh and this is what's um, this is what's driving it right and uh and so uh there's also many things in the news about um uh about uh instit institutions trying to rebuild the temple and uh, coming onto the temple and doing all of these things so uh, so, yeah, so the, I think that in Islamic times, so there's no mention of third temple in the, um, in Muslim sources. The, the only thing that's there in the Muslim sources is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He told us that this site of the Dome of the Rock is a holy site. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد. Journeys should not be undertaken to travel to mosques except to three mosques there's only three mosques worth traveling to the the mosque in mecca the mosque in medina and the mosque in uh in uh, uh in al-aqsa which is just important to clarify people think well, hang on what, what, what do you mean there's no mosque in jerusalem but of course yeah. 
of the distinctively Islamic kind of mosques that that postdated that. But of course, mosque or masjid, more correctly, mosque is I think it's a French word, isn't it? Um, the way it's spelled. But masjid in Arabic means a place of prostration, exactly. Which, which means yeah. obviously uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem does qualify that. So it is a uh, a, a mosque in the original Arabic Islamic sense rather than in the later sense of a place where Muslims go because obviously in that sense of yeah. people who acknowledge the Prophet Muhammad as a prophet uh, that that wasn't the case before he, he was born uh, if, if that makes sense yeah that, yeah thanks that's exactly right so it's a place of worship place of worshiping God hmm. place of worshiping God so he encouraged and he anticipated that Muslims would go there and when Muslims they built the Dome of the Rock um, that's what happened. So if we now read these third temple prophecies in light of uh, our, uh, you know, our, our, our narrative, our view of what's happening, um, then the Dome of the Rock is the third temple. That is, so if these prophecies are genuine, they may be genuine, they may not be genuine. If they're genuine, then they would be fulfilled by the Dome of the Rock because uh, because when the Dome of the Rock was constructed, it is the third temple because a temple is not something that belongs to a particular ethnicity of people uh, mm -hmm. by virtue of their privileged relationship to God. It is a place for submission to God. And that that's what happened with the Muslims. And they venerated it and nobody had venerated it. For 500 years, nobody had venerated it. So. It was it was desecration. It was garbage. Done. The Muslims venerated it, and the the biblical verses that talk about people coming from all over the world that was fulfilled because people literally they came and they have continued to come to worship God and hallow His name. And the you know the prayer of Solomon you know, it rings so loudly that that you know any anyone any foreigner who comes to hallow your name alone accept it, hear him. Um, they came from all over the world, all nations, they came here. And when the Muslims came, they brought the kingdom of God to Jerusalem because the kingdom of God, it means that the people who submit to God have the freedom to worship God and they're not persecuted and people live by the commands of God. And that's what happened for hundreds of years um, over there. And so um, so the Dome of the Rock, it, it is the... It is the third temple, mm -hmm. and um, and what this means basically is that if we if we look at what's happening now in light of this understanding, then um, the 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 Jewish people who wants to dis who wants to who are fighting against the Muslims and trying to expel them from the land and expel them from the from, from, from the temple, they're, they're, they're doing just what their ancestors did. They're doing what happened at the, before the destruction of the first temple, before the destruction of the second temple. But there's something even more grave that's happening. Um, although I don't, I, don't say, I don't think it's even more grave because the gravest thing is shedding of innocent blood. That's the greatest thing. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that the spilling of a single drop of blood is greater uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 more holy. A single drop of blood is more holy than the Kaaba. So, uh, but they're doing something that has never been done before. Is that they're actually destroying the temple with their own hands? If it if it happens, may it never happen. But but if it happens, that that that's what that's what they would be. Uh, that's what they the, would supreme, be the supreme irony you're you're saying supreme irony of, of history that they should be attempting to do that. Well, and was yeah. claiming to to. Be Jews in the sense of their ancestors were Jews, and it's a DNA thing. It's a, an ethnic thing. Rather, it's a form of ethnic nationalism, as people have pointed out, rather than the biblical uh, uh, s submission to the one true God. Uh, yeah, it's it's extraordinary. It's more dangerous than ethnic nationalism because uh, because uh, 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 because there's a religious element that comes in, right? And uh, you know, and you have like your appointed. It's it's from God, like you're, you're chosen by God. Um, and a lot of these people, are, 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 as we know from recent events, who are going to the occupied uh, parts of Palestine, like the West Bank, uh, you, you see an increase in uh, often Americans, actually, who uh, believe they commissioned by God to go there and remove the people, people uh, remove the people who are living there, Palestinians, their homes, uh, attack them, kill them. Um, 
and this is mainstream news now it's all over twitter it's all over the news that this is actually accelerating at the moment as we speak um the 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 literal genocide ethnic cleansing of um a, a people and it's a terrible war crime and uh and the West is standing by this, of course, because it supports Israel uh, shoulder to shoulder. This is, a, I, I've spoken many, many times, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine by the yeah. renowned uh, professor of history, Ilan Papi, who is himself Israeli, actually. Um, and he uses lots of original source material from the IDF archives, for example, to demonstrate that this idea of modern Zionism uh, from its inception intended to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians. There's not some kind of aberration that happened later on. This is part of the DNA of the ideology itself, is to remove a whole people from its land uh, by force uh, and uh, and replace them with Euro Europeans, Americans, wh whoever. So it's a form of settler colonialism. It's a form of ethnic cleansing. But now a lot of it's religious, isn't it? It's become, because the, the original founder of Zionism, Herzl, in, who's actually a Swiss, a guy from Switzerland, actually, a Jewish guy, uh, he was an atheist, but yeah. a lot of these new guys who are coming in, Americans and others, are religious fanatics. And um, yeah. fortunately, there are passages in the Torah that do talk about the genocide of the Canaanites in their land. And these are the ancestors of the Palestinians, of course. So this is going back thousands of years. It's, you know, that those who think the Bible is out of date and irrelevant to modern life, it is being weaponized as we speak now by people and uh, it couldn't be more important that we understand the theological and the biblical and the islamic understandings because it's all happening now in front of mm -hmm. our eyes and uh, this secular reading of politics that you mentioned at the beginning you said you're not a political analyst you said you're a theologian um it, it, you know the political analysts who ignore theology and the northern religious dimension which is fundamental are really not getting the big picture at all they're not getting mm -hmm. the holistic perspective no. which is absolutely necessary if you just no. read it through the the secular lens you're going to miss what's going on you get some of it because there's actually physical stuff happening but you're going to miss the bigger picture uh the, and and that's that's what you're providing alhamdulillah uh and that's what's necessary to understand what's really happening and there's the unseen realm we haven't even touched on that you know the, the forces at work in in our modern world shaitan and so on who are uh, involved in these events, orchestrating them to the destruction of human beings. There's that dimension as well. We haven't even touched on that. Yeah, we pray for um, we pray for peace. I mean, uh, that's what we want. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he came. Um, he did not come to start wars. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to call people uh, to the truth, and that's what. Uh, that's what Moses came to do. And you know the, the verses of Moses where he speaks to the Pharaoh are so instructive because he says to the Pharaoh who was doing something that's very similar to what's happening now. I mean, he took uh, people by uh, virtue of their um, ethnicity and he enslaved them, he was slaughtering them, he was ethnically cleansing them. Yeah. And um, and and Moses in the Quran he came to Pharaoh and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that he said he said to him, "Inni Rasul Rabbil Alamin." Verily, I am a messenger from God, messenger from the Lord of the, of the worlds, and the Lord of the worlds is commanding you to set the children of Israel free. And so the um, and if you don't do that, then I threaten you with a punishment. So the the call. The call of um, the call of Moses was a call to fear God. It was a call to obey God, and it was a call to to um, fear God's um, God's punishment. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I this is something that I would I would like to see more of. Um, I think that uh, that this is a this is a call that that Muslims they need to give, and it's their responsibility, and it's absent in the in the mainstream of course um just last of all i'd re recommend this book as well uh, if you want um a more scholarly analysis i don't mean more scholarly than what you said i mean if you want a scholarly analysis of <laughs> judaism judaism history belief and practice um now the reason i recommend this particular uh book is um when i had the good fortune of visiting Zaytuna College earlier this year. I sat in on a class taught by Dr. Uh, Ali Atai, 
And this book on Judaism was the set text that Zaytuna um, is written by a, a Jewish uh, rabbi, an academic. But um, Ali Atai recommends it. I recommend it. It's a very, very good book if you want a good objective historical grounding uh, on uh, the history, beliefs and practices of Judaism going back right to, to the beginning. Um, so I recommend that book too. It, it's not necessarily covering everything you've said, but it does mention the uh, uh, some many many of the issues. So well, thank yeah. you very much uh, indeed for your fascinating uh, presentation and much food for thought there. And uh, uh, inshallah, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Until next time. Salam alaikum.